Hello, my name is Brian, and I am the developer of Lost and Hound, and I'm going to be taking you through the why I think the future of accessibility is uh, fusing accessibility with game design or inclusive design. Um, and I'm going to show you what um, the industry is doing in this area and what I'm doing and kind of give you best practices of both, I suppose. Distilled down to its simplest forms, accessibility is really just allowing players to customize how information is sent and received. Accessibility is usually this kind of, you know, arcane term that is very, you know, it's like a blanket term meaning a lot of different things. If we just simplify it, just make it completely simple, all we're really doing is broadening the ways that the game communicates to the player and the player communicates to the game. That's it, that's all it is. Why talk about this? There are resources that outline best practices in accessibility such as gameaccessibilityguidelines.com, um, the APX deck from Able Gamers, and um, they mainly cover user interface and menu settings and that kind of stuff. This will cover the actual guts of what makes a game and how we can bend it and shape it to be designed for inclusivity. Why should I be talking about this? Why me? Um, I'm in a unique position to be the only one that I know of that has designed a full game around accessibility. I'm aware that this is a lofty claim and I very deeply wish to be wrong about this. Um, please reach out and tell me if I am because I would love to know about other developers who wrapped a game around accessibility instead of the other way around. Um, Lost and Hound is a game designed so that people of all bodily ability can play at the same level of enjoyment and success. When I showed the game at PAX East in 2018, um, I saw a lot of really cool things. I saw a nine-year-old blind girl fly through the demo, and I saw an able-bodied 30-something um, Souls, you know, Dark Souls fan. Um, hardcore gamer really struggle with it. So the the that's the goal. The perfectly accessible game is one that designs accessibility into its core structure. Um, it's not a type of game that, that finishes its development process and then adds accessibility on kind of as an extra feature. Um, people don't know that Lost and Hound has, has essentially done this until I tell them. Um, that's the goal, in my opinion. That's what we're trying to do. So before we... Before we get too much further, I'm actually just going to show a clip of the game and then we'll move on and I'll talk about a few other things going on in the industry and eventually we'll kind of circle back to it. But I, I don't want to be talking about the game so much without actually showing you what it is. So we'll do that first right now. So here you can see you're playing as the dog and you are trying to find a scent trail. They're sniffing right now and the compass up top and the sound shows you where the scent trail is. Here it is again. And now you hear that humming sound. That humming sound is what the player has to follow, and at the end of it is the person that they're trying to track, their quarry. Right here you see the player's lost it, and when they go off the scent trail, you can see the colors pale. Look for that. the scent trail go up and there's a visual mark on the scent trail once every 25 seconds you can see the progress bar in the lower right filling back up when they go off the scent trail it goes pale just like right now all the all the colors are slightly pale you can't hear the humming sound now you can hear it again the color vibrancy comes back And that's how the game works. It's kind of a clue system. The scent trail is like a, you're following these clues to find somebody at the end of it. Okay, we're back. Commonly forgotten accessibility measures that are embarrassingly simple to implement or kafam tasty for short. Um, but it's not real. Don't, um, don't 
remember that. Muscular limitation accessibility. We're just going to really quickly go over very, very basic kind of shortcuts, or not shortcuts, but like a cheat sheet for very, very basic accessibility of the four main types. Um, simple hand control scheme, remappable controls, safe mode, um, reflexes made irrelevant. That one's a big one, and we'll be coming back to that a lot. Does the player have to press and hold any buttons? That's also very important. Um, Hearing impairment accessibility, subtitles on all dialogue, including the mood of the spoken text. That's rarely done. Um, and, you know, speaking of which, I actually need to go back into Lost and Hound and add that a bit myself. But that's that's rarely done. Inflection is is a big deal. Inflection, you know, really carries a lot of weight into the words. Um, and people who are hearing impaired are not going to get the inflection. So you need to give them the inflection. Um, subtitle on important sound cues. This is where the word embarrassing comes from in the earlier silly acronym. This is done embarrassingly often. Um, if there's a knock on the door to prompt the player to go to the door, it's often not visually shown. So someone that has a hearing disability isn't going to know what to do. Um, they're just going to be sitting there waiting for a cue given to them. And if you only put that knocking sound you're not giving them anything you're not giving um a section of your players the information they need to succeed and that's on you uh phone vibrating and moving could be a solution to this if you can see the phone kind of jiggling back and forth on a desk or whatever while it's ringing um another big one heartbeat and ticking clock are often used without any visual stimuli or visual kind of i don't know component um Pairing component, I don't know how to, you know what I mean, you get it. Um, the heartbeat and a ticking clock, they're often used to imply pressure and they don't often have visual cues. That's that's important. Um, medium and large text size, also important. We all know this, you know, that's one that you get. Vision impairment, accessibility, uh, narration on menus, on UI, on, you know, your journal, if there is one in game, quest objectives, whatever. Um, but also on the actual things in game that you need to get to. The Last of Us Part Two excelled massively in this. There were um, radar sounds, is what the blind community calls it, radar sounds where they need to go. So it tells me, oh, okay, yeah, I need to go over there. Um, the next one is something called an anchor. This is one that I named, I named it that, anchor. So in, you'll see the next slide. Um, so in Lost and Hound, in the first level, this is a river that bisects the first level. And that's how a blind person can map it out in their head. That's where they start to make a map is saying, oh, yeah, OK, it's on this side of the river um, and it's, you know, upstream, whatever. Um, you'll see that in just a minute. Ability to defend self from harm in a 3D game. This is a pretty big deal. Um, and again, you know, you know about all the UI stuff, you know about bigger texts, you know about light colors on darker backgrounds, you know all that stuff. Um, but now we're talking about actual game design. Have you given your player the ability to defend themselves from harm? Um, and something that really succeeds in this, you'll see in 4B there, is blocking in stereo fighting games. Um, stereo meaning uh, two-channel sound. Um, so if a blind player is playing a fighting game that's in stereo, they know where their enemy is coming from. They know the direction they're coming from, and they they know they have the power to, to protect themselves to block. Um, ability to dis defend self from harm in Lost and Hound. The way that I did it, I'll show you more in depth later. The way that I did it is you can have a companion dog. You choose one every mission, and there are four. One of them protects you. So this is and the the purpose of that was for this kind of accessibility is. Do you give your player the tool to actually defend themselves? And the answer for that one is yes. So this is the level that I was talking about. You can see the river going right through the middle. And that's an anchor because you can hear it from almost everywhere on the level. So the player can use it to map out the level in their mind. Um, and that's a really simple design choice. But we, we don't, you know, we, we don't often do it. So now we're really getting into the nitty gritty of design here. Three levels of accessibility assistance. The first one is the most common, and it's the explicit. Meaning, player, do this, X, Y, Z. Um, it's usually done through user interface, UI. 
Um, you are very common with this. You you see tooltips. You see um, changeable text size. You can see things that accessibility measures that come through text to you, the player. Um, number two, this one is not as common. Surface level. It is informative game design, meaning something that is natural to your game world. Telling a player that is disabled, you might want to do this if you, you know, if if those are if that's a that's something that's among your needs. Um, and again, not in a UI way, not in an extra kind of outside of the game way. I'll give you examples of this in the next few slides. Um, and the third one is deep game design, meaning the the, the every tool that the player needs to succeed in your game is a core part of the game. This is pretty rare, and I, I've got examples for this coming up. So number one, back to explicit. Um, any source in-game that tells players what they can modify, tooltips, tutorial text, screen readers, remappable keys, changeable text size, subtitles, your your this is the most common form of accessibility so you're you're very well well versed in this um we can just move right on surface level game design this changes the game world somehow whereas the the previous type adds information to the game sorry i'm switch, switching the screen so much so explicit accessibility adds information Surface level accessibility changes the game world. Um, if you look down into example A, Rebuild 3, which is a base builder uh, zombie defense game, one of my favorites, um, it allows for players to switch between real-time strategy or turn-based strategy. That is so important because if you can make time, if you can make the player have the ability to pause time, that adds a massive breadth of accessibility. Um, to give you an example, in the if there's a cognitive disability, um, a player due to a disability may need more time to process, may need more time to make their decisions. So if you can take time off the table as something that the players have to deal with, um, you will create a much more accessible game. Another example is the JRPG genre is among the most popular in audio games the games for blind people and the reason for that is because it's it's turn-based it's not time-based so a player can you know scroll the screen reader over to their mana check how much mana they have check if they have enough for an ability that they're thinking of take time off the table and you are taking massive steps forward um lost and hound choice of companion dogs that alter gameplay i Mention that a little. I'll mention it in much more detail and show you the slide that, that lays that out in a moment. Unpacking game mode, allowing objects to be placed anywhere, removing the puzzle aspect. This is another one that opens up accessibility to, uh, opens up the game to a lot of different accessibility needs. Um, and I'll, sh I'll show you that one too in a minute. Phasmophobia, this is one of my favorite games. Um, they just updated its horror game. Phasmophobia is a ghost investigation horror game. And um, they just added custom game mode. And you can, you can change almost anything that happens in game to your liking, to your um, preference of how you want to play. And again, I mean, we said this at the beginning, accessibility, good accessibility is just the customization of gameplay, of receiving information and sending information. So Phasmophobia, they, they made a custom game mode where you can change almost anything one of them that people are using is they're turning off the hunt phase where the ghost tries to hunt you and kill you. Um, and removing that, suddenly it's this investigation game where people can take their time. Again, time is no longer something that the player has to deal with. Um, and it, it really opens the game's possibilities up. So this is the first one I showed you, Rebuild 3. If you look in the lower right, there is a clock. That clock represents this game mode, which is real-time strategy. So that clock is elapsing, and the green, the, there's um, it, so the clock is you know obviously a circle, and it is about seventy percent filled with green, and it's kind of emptying from the top down. So obviously, it's showing that time is running out. If you look in the lower right, there's now a pause button. 
So we've changed the game over to turn-based, which means the player clicks next day when they're good and ready. Um, this is so often overlooked, and it accomplishes so much in making a game accessible. Surface-level game design. This is um, a screenshot from my game, Lost and Hound. So you can choose a companion dog for each mission, and each companion dog changes your game slightly. So if you look at Tiga, he is a protector. He defends Biscuit from harm. Again, he if you choose Tiga, he removes time and reflexes as a barrier or as a progression barrier. Um, this is for any cognitive disability. This is for a muscular or a motor um, limitation. This is for people that want to play a game and not be inhibited by not being able to press a specific button fast enough. And that's, that's really important. Um, if you look at Luna, she is a sight hound and she translates all of the visual, all of the, um, the audio information in game to visual. And that's important because scent in the game is represented by sound. That's how it's blind accessible. Um, so Luna takes all of that information that the player is getting through sound and she switches it over to sight. So instead of um, hearing a sound that represents the scent trail, if you're far away from where you need to be, if you're off the scent trail, the colors of the game fade very slightly. And I can show you on a clip right here. And Gus is a scent hound and he will help people who struggle with the trail. So his, his expertise is both for hearing and vision disabilities. He will just help you do your job better. He'll he's built for both types. Um, and that, that's what I mean by surface level. So all of this stuff is it's native to the game. It's naturally placed within the game, but the design is to tell people with different needs, you can choose this if your needs are this. Um, it's not explicit because it's not saying people with motor disabilities choose Tika. It's saying if you want to be defended from harm, choose Tika. So it's it's keeping everything in in world. It's keeping everything kind of diegetic, I guess. This is unpacking that we talked about a few slides ago. Um, so unpacking has a game mode where you don't have to figure out the exact right place to place every item. Um, and that's what the game's all about. It's you're literally unpacking from a move and it tells the story through that. Um, it won most accessible game in at the Australian Game Dev Awards in 2021. Um, and this game mode opens it up to, a, a, again, a very wide breadth of um, possible players. Phasmophobia custom game mode allows for time irrelevant investigation, no ghost hunts. Um, going back to that idea that accessibility when distilled down to its simplest terms is customization. So now we are in the deep level of inclusive game design. This is something that just isn't done enough. As far as I know, I've done the most work on this. I've, I've built a game around accessibility. Um, I would love to hear about more people who have done this. I have not quite yet. Um, so accessibility was always a part of the game world. So if you think back to that clip in Lost and Hound, you are following a scent trail and it is represented by sound. It is also represented by the colors fading. Um, so the main mechanic of the game is giving me all the information that I need whether I am um, with a vision impairment, whether I'm with, it, with a um, hearing impairment, um, it doesn't stop me from playing this game at its, at its designed level. And that's, that's where we need to get. Um, so let's go over the mechanics of some other games. So stereo audio in fighting games. For blind accessibility, I mentioned that one earlier. Um, games not requiring color in their puzzle elements for puzzle blindness. This is another one. If you can design a puzzle element without sound or color coming in one, in one way, meaning, you know, we mentioned that ringing phone. If you can, if you can have information coming in, in both audio and visual channels, 
if you cannot have color in the puzzle element, you're already designing inclusively. Um, natural or organic visual cues accompanied by audio. We mentioned that one. Uh, and Lost and Hound, the main mechanic. And this is, again, what I spoke on. I really think the next step in accessibility is to abandon retrofitting. Um, I think games are soon going to stop finishing a game and then looking back and saying, how can I make this accessible? Because it's clumsy and it treats accessibility as an afterthought. People who are disabled that are listening to this, this is nothing new. And there's, you know, I know that you're thinking you've always known this, whereas us able-bodied people, you're really just discovering it. Accessibility has to have a seat at the table in every design talk from day one. And that's what I've done with Lost and Hound. And that's why, you know, again, I think I have the right to talk to you about this. So features of the game, Lost and Hound, are large, open 3D levels, no time requirements. We talked about time a lot. No scores or encouraged competition. Natural setting for blind accessibility. And this is a big one. Scent tracking dogs don't use their eyes in their work. Um, this is something we need to think about more in games is there are a lot of natural settings for accessibility that we're not really taking advantage of. Um, another one is another game that I'm working on with the team and it's a submarine game. It's a four player co-op um, like ecological vigilante game where you you're in this rinky dink sub and you're trying to like sabotage, um, you know, people who are trying to plunder the ocean for wealth essentially. But again, submarines don't use, Vision, they use coordinates and they use sonar. Um, and because of that setting, suddenly accessibility isn't an external force. It's not an external process, I guess would be better. It's part of the game. It's part of the, it's part of the natural design of the game world that's kind of already there um, to allow blind people to play it. Um, has a Watson. So what I mean by this is the, and it's a very clever narrative design choice because, you know, Watson's a doctor and he's smart and he's real, you know, he's, he's really, really clever. So if I'm reading about this doctor that has no clue what's going on, I don't feel dumb as the reader because obviously I can't ask Sherlock those questions. So Watson does for me. But if this guy doesn't get it, it's fine that I don't get it, right? But but the fact is, he's a narrative design choice that exists to add more kind of layman information, I guess. Um, and Lost and Hound has that. You know, I, I kind of recognize that for what it was. And the trainer, your your owner, you play as the dog in Lost and Hound, but your owner follows you around and he kind of points this stuff out. And he, he points things out, not necessarily that you don't know, but that a blind person wouldn't see. Um, so he, he adds a lot of color to the story simply because he's kind of an external narration force, um, just like Watson in the book. Example of accessibility fused with the core game design. What if he... Walking away from the trail now, walking off the trail, you see the colors pale. And you hear the sound come back. talked before about specifically how Luna works, um, as in she is the companion choice that assists with, um, assists with hearing accessibility. And this is how she does it. So you can see the colors are, um, the colors are pale, and as Biscuit walks back onto the trail, the colors will deepen in vibrancy. Yep, there it goes. 
And um, Luna will also have the added clues of footsteps and other things like bent blades of grass um, that, you know, you, you heard about this earlier. Yeah, the footsteps right there, there they are. So she adds visual information that isn't there with any other choice. And this one is this uh, Tega. This one is Tega. You can see that. You can see that here. I'll just show you what that means. Look right up to a snake that would restart the level with any other character, and he scares it away. Tega will chase away the snakes. Um, I just want to mention this, even though it's kind of not quite on topic. But I, I try to mention this in every one of my presentations because it's just so rarely mentioned. I've, I, I don't think I've seen another presentation with it, not that I can remember. Microsoft um, or Xbox has something called Copilot Mode, and it's taking two controllers and it's it's streaming them into one output. Um, it allows for two players to play a one char one character games like God of War, you know, whatever Assassin's Creed, whatever. Um, which means, you know, you can you can kind of replay some of these one player games with a friend with a severe disability that wouldn't be able to play it otherwise. <laughs> it also allows for one player to use two controllers, whereas if there is a motor disability and the hands can't be close together to hold a controller, they can be far apart and the player can use two controllers. So to wrap everything up, I haven't really seen this talked about yet, and I think we're coming to kind of a more evolved and a more refined time in game accessibility, and we're going to start to see things like this more and more. Um, I think, uh, you know, we need to begin considering the aesthetics of accessibility. We're at the point now where if a game has accessibility measures at all, we're thrilled. You know, great. It's, it's you know, a cause to celebrate, but... We have more that we could be doing. You know, we're, we've done, it's kind of these two conflicting thoughts. We've, we've done more than we've ever, you know, seen before in terms of how far we're getting in accessibility games. That's point one. Point two is we have so much more work to do, right? Um, we're slowly moving towards a point where we have to consider the quality and aesthetics of our accessibility measures. A hard truth we have to face is that accessibility can be patronizing especially the more UI focused it is. The purpose of UI based accessibility is to say, hey, you, you're different than most gamers and you need your other stuff. Here's the other stuff. Again, it's awesome when a game has UI accessibility, but it still evokes a sense of other. And if we can get rid of that, that's a massive step forward too. Um, you know, I'm, it's a, it's a kind of feeling like we, we shouldn't be upset that someone's come to the party late. We should just be happy that they're here at all. But at the same time, if you can use this kind of deep design idea as opposed to a UI-based accessibility communication system, your players are going to thank you for it. What if we could still provide a player what they need without fragmenting them from the able-bodied community? The more you design accessibility into your game, the less you'll have to provide explicit instruction and the less patronizing your communications will be. So what all of this goes down to is make accessibility a priority from the beginning. Your game is going to be have a, have a wider audience. It's going to have a more diverse audience. And it's going to be more satisfying to your able-bodied players. And that's a point we don't talk about enough is accessibility is the fulfilling of needs. You know, it is the customization of game player. Able-bodied players want that too. You know, you've seen and heard the statistics about how the more accessible a game is, usually the higher rating it has in terms of AAA games on uh, Metacritic or whatever. And that's because... Fully able-bodied people like subtitles. You know, they like customizable font sizes. They like um, different game movement schemes. So the more customization your game has, the more your players are going to like it. Accessibility is not, you know, making your game accessible. 
two players of different abilities. It is making a much wider and much more enthusiastic fan base accessible to your content. Um, so um, if you want to find me on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, um, here's all my information. I love talking about this stuff. I love talking shop. Please reach out to me and let's, you know, have a conversation. Let's see how we can get your game more accessible. Um, let's start a dialogue. And I hope this was helpful. Thank you.